Hello everyone, welcome back to what I am now calling Wing Leader Flight Training with me, Evil Dr. Ganymede. Before we get into actually playing through a scenario and me showing you how all the rules work, I thought I would take some time to go over some of the key concepts or what I think are the key concepts in Wing Leader. Things that can trip people up. Maybe they're expecting the game to work a certain way, but it doesn't actually work like that. So I thought I'd go over a few of those things and kind of soften the blow for anyone who wants to learn how to play the game. The first thing I'll go over are missions. This being a World War II air combat game, Squadrons have set missions that they are on when they're out and about. They're either sent on, let's go over here and have a look, uh, intercept missions, bombing, escort, sweep, transport, cap, and there's a few other things as well, reconnaissance and so on, recce's. Uh, but there's basically a bunch of fixed missions, and what these mean is that you can't just do whatever you want when they're intercepting for example as the chinese fighters are doing here like these two and the p40e in the back they're they're on intercept missions what that means is that they are assigned a vector which is what this is this is actually the flip side of the tally counter and they are told to go towards that. And that's what they do. So when you're doing your turn as the Chinese, what you're going to be doing is moving your planes towards wherever you put these vectors. So B is going to move towards vector B, A is going to move towards vector A, and uh, P back here is going to move towards vector P. And that's all you can do. You're not going to be able to just go all over the place uh, you know, any route you want. You have to go the shortest possible route towards that vector and you'll get slowly moved towards that as the turns go on. You can do things like try and find your enemy uh, along the way, but you can't deviate really from that path until you do that. So there's things like bombing missions as well. Like these two bombers here, all they're going to do is just go forward. That's the only thing they can do. They have to go forward. I think it's a couple of spaces each turn, and that's it. Like in a more complex mission, they'll have actual bombing to do. Uh, in this mission, they don't. They're just carrying bombs. Their target is off the map, basically, but they're just trying to get there at the moment. But um, you know, they'll have a bit more choice about what to do then because then they have to actually get into a position where they're going to be able to drop the bombs on the target and so on. But otherwise, they're just going forward two spaces each turn and that's it. The sweepers up here, these are uh, on a sweep mission. Um, they're really, you know, it actually says they're set up as if they're escorts, but I think they're just set up as sweeps kind of to make this a little bit easier to deal with but as sweeps they are also fixed they just move forward a couple of squares per turn until they spot somebody and then they can go and pursue them or attack them or whatever or they can come back and join the bombers they've got a few more choices as, as sweepers but not many more uh, as escorts they would pretty much just be constrained to the bombers because their job is to escort the bombers you're basically being told to escort them to a destination you're not going to wander off and do something else generally uh, unless something really urgent happens but you know most of the time they're going to be sticking to their mission so this isn't like things like say x-wing or whatever where you can just take any path you choose towards your target or whatever You've got a fixed path that you have to abide by. That's the first thing to get your head around. Like There's limited options for what you can actually do. Not that they're 
utterly like a straitjacket or anything, but you just have to get used to this idea that you just can't do anything that you want to do. The next thing is tallying. You might think with this big map that, you know, hey, from over here I can just shoot this guy and, you know, there'll be a range and so on and so forth, and it doesn't really work like that. Right now, all of these planes are basically unaware of each other. And also keep in mind that these are not single planes. They're not even two planes, as, as are shown on the squadrons. These are many planes. You know, the squadrons could be up to 12 planes, let's say. The flights are probably going to be about half that. So, you know, 12 or 6 planes, 8 or 4 planes or whatever. But each counter is several planes. But all these planes are, are really unaware of each other. The Chinese ones are alerted at the start of the scenario, so they know there's something out there, but they don't know where they are. Similarly, the Japanese ones up here, I mean, these ones actually aren't alerted, so they're just merrily flying along, minding their own business, trying to get to their target, but they don't really have a clue that there's anyone else out there. And the thing with this is that you have to tally the target before you can actually attack it. And... That means you can't actually really change your mission until you've tallied a target. So when you're moving your planes along, or you're going to have the option at least of making tallying rolls to see if you can spot an enemy target. Once you've spotted the target, then that's when you get your freedom because then you can move freely, essentially, to try to get to it, and you can try and manoeuvre yourself into a position where you're, say, you're going to be able to come out of the sun or come from above or whatever. So you've got a little bit of flexibility after you've spotted a target, because then, you know, you can break away and and actually start to, you know, get yourself in a tactically good place. But until you've done that, you're sticking to your mission. And the tallying really, because it's based on a, a, a D6 roll, and if we actually go and have a look up here, tallying is actually, if the roll is greater than the distance to the target, you put a tally marker on the enemy unit. There's a few modifiers here, but because of these, like the most you're, a, the, the furthest you're going to be able to see them is nine squares with optimal conditions. Most of the time, you're not going to be able to see them until you're about six squares minimum from them. So, like this guy, well, this guy, let's say, you wouldn't be able to see, you wouldn't really be able to see him until you're about here. But you'll be able to have a higher chance of seeing him when you're more like this kind of distance from him. Until that point, you just carry on with your mission blissfully oblivious. And the way it works because you've got a roll greater than the distance to the target, like, if you're one square away, like, the, if this guy is literally here, he still might not be able to see this plane, you know, this squadron, because he has to roll a 2 or more on a 1d6, and if he rolls a 1, he's just oblivious. And it might seem a bit dumb, but you've got to remember that this is the entirety of the sky. Like, this is a massive volume. <laughs> Aside from anything else, the pilots are, you know, stuck in a bubble cockpit. It may not have a good rear view. You know, they're looking mostly front, sides, up. You know, underneath the plane is harder to see. Um, you know, they can manoeuvre around a little bit to get more views, you know, like tip their wings and so on. But, you know, like, they, they can't look everywhere at once. And even if you're one square away, because this is a side view of the uh, of the sky, you don't have that in and out kind of 3Dness here. Like so, you know, they might be one square away, but you know, there could be ones way off to the left or the right or something like that. You know, or or still far enough above or below that they're not visible. So it's not kind of expected that you're just going to instantly be able to see a target, uh, even if you're up close to them. That's another concept you've got to get your head around, that you, you can't actually attack them until you've seen them. And also that you can't attack them until you're actually in the same square. So most of the time, I mean, there's things like there are rockets and things that you can have 
like you know basically primitive missiles uh, that do have a bit of a range to them but pretty much all combat uh, in the air is going to take place in that square so there's no you know I'm two squares away from you and, you know that's medium range for me I get a minus one modifier or whatever there's nothing like that it's just it's all or nothing you're either not in their square and not able to attack them or you're in their square and able to attack them that's it so that's all something that you want to get your head around really because like i said it's not going to work the same way as something like x-wing or or anything like that the next important thing is disruption so really that can be summarized as it's not about the kills so remember i said that the squadrons are made up of multiple planes 8 or 12 or 16 or whatever planes in the squadron and 4 or 6 or 8 planes in a flight and obviously you're going in there trying to shoot the enemy up and so on but it's not about how many actual kills you get like how many planes you destroy so much as how much you disrupt the squadron. And the squadrons can be disrupted very, very easily. They're very fragile. And this is, again, you know, mirroring the reality of World War II air combat because you have a bunch of planes in a vast volume that engage each other, do a couple of passes, and that's basically that's it. They're flying past each other at ridiculous speeds. They'll get a few hits in on each other. They may not necessarily shoot a plane down, but they'll they'll kind of break up the formation, they'll break up the squadron. Planes will go every which direction trying to evade their enemies or people chasing them or whatever. And it's very easy for pilots to just suddenly go from the thick of a fight to there's nobody around me at all. And they don't know where the heck everyone else is either because the fights, you know, moved ahead a few kilometers or something by the time they realize where they are. So... What usually happens is that the flights and the squadrons get disrupted. Um, and this is what the cohesion role and the cohesion table is all about. And it's pretty easy, really, to get disrupted. Now you look at a fighter squadron here, and you see, like, this is a, a 2d6 roll. And on a 6 or less, the squadron is going to be disrupted. Like, without anything else happening, without any other modifiers on a six or less, after a fight or after a, a round of combat, a squadron could be disrupted. And that's, what, a 42% chance? So right there, you know, you've got uh, the squadron going from a coherent fighting unit to it's lost a few of its planes or, you know, they're all in different places and they don't know where each other are, where the enemy is and so on. They're a bit confused. And when they actually get to be disrupted again, or if they have some really bad luck and get, just get broken straight away, then they're gone as a fighting unit. They, they just don't work anymore. And as you can see from the table, a squadron, being a larger number of planes, is a bit harder to disrupt than a flight, which is usually about half the number of planes that are in a, a squadron. Uh, so flights are a lot more fragile and a lot more, you know, they've got a 42% chance just straight up of just being broken. And anything, you know, just being in a combat, it will break or can break or disrupt uh, a squadron or a flight. Um, because, you know, let's face it, it's a very stressful situation. You've got a lot of confusion, probably got a lot of rookie pilots as well. Planes going everywhere, everyone's being shot at, and like I said, you're going to end up suddenly in the middle of nowhere, and you know you don't know what to do anymore. And most of the time, when people ended up in the middle of nowhere, and they're not nowhere near the fight anymore, it's too late to turn back and try and chase the, the formation. They just turn around and go home, or try and go home. So, you know, there comes a point where they're just broken, and the the squadron isn't an effective fighting unit so what you actually end up with is that you're you think ah i'm gonna go into this fight and i'm gonna tear up the enemy and it's gonna be great and we're gonna fight to the death no that doesn't happen what happens is you have 
a couple of shots basically at each other and ultimately one of you is going to break and then they go home and the other the survivors limp on and they're severely depleted as well at that point because as you're fighting you're using ammo and you know you've already taken a few losses probably so these modifiers are mounting up so that if you get into another combat later on you're way less effective than you were when you started off the scenario so the combats are a, a matter of attrition really you know, ideally you're going to kind of do an alpha strike, I guess you'd call it, at the beginning, where you're just, you're at full capability, you're just, you know, hoping that you're going to be able to take as many of the other side out as possible to shoot them down or turn them into stragglers or whatever, and hoping that you do enough damage that they'll get disrupted or broken. And after that, the balance is tipped so that really it's just worse for both sides as time goes on in a combat. Like the longer the combat goes, the harder it is for either of the sides to really get that killing blow in and, you know, the more fragile they become. I think that's an important thing to get your head around. That That's something that seemed really weird to me, certainly when I started learning the game. But uh, it makes a lot of sense in terms of what they're actually modeling here which is you know squadron to squadron combat a corollary to that is that the combats will be well i say they're going to be short they could be drawn out if everyone's really lucky and just doesn't you know rolls high enough on the cohesion tables that they don't disrupt but they generally tend to be short like a few rounds of combat will usually be enough to determine who's who the winner of that specific combat is it becomes kind of important when especially when you have planes joining the scenario after a certain number of turns because they're coming in fresh whereas all the the planes that started off the first few turns of the scenario are, are just you know running on fumes at that point uh if they're still in the game at all but you know specific combats tend to be short at least among fighters Bombers can last a bit longer because, as you can see here, they have a smaller chance of being disrupted. Like, instead of, was it 42%, they're more like 16%. Uh, and that's largely because the bomber crews were, were told and trained to just, like, stay on target. <laughs> you know, they've got their escorts and things like that, sweepers to protect them. They They have to kind of trust in them to keep the interceptors away but not that the bombers themselves weren't well defended themselves because you know, obviously they had their own cannons and tail gunners and things like that but their job was to just stay on target so they're a bit harder to break and they're also you know they're just tougher because they're bombers as well so that's a, a, another thing to keep in mind the last thing really is the I guess what you would call uh, the concept of planes on rails or at least like the scenarios are running on rails and this is a reflection of the decision space in the game the wing leader has been accused of being a low decision space game and it's not entirely unjustified because as you might have imagined from what i've described here there isn't an awful lot of decisions to be made in this game compared to other games when you actually get into a combat you're basically just going up here adding up modifiers and rolling a dice and seeing what happens when you're seeing whether you're disrupted or broken you're adding up some modifiers rolling dice see what happens if you're seeing you know how many losses you take in the combat rolling the dice seeing what happens and so on there's a lot of dice rolling going on here and that's definitely something that people may not expect in a game like this but again remember that this is squadron scale combat this isn't individual planes fighting each other like x-wing or even wild blue yonder slash down in flames or whatever like that there's more decisions to be made at that level because you're in a, a single vehicle 
you know, you can go, okay, am I going to do a barrel roll? Do I want to come at him from the side or above? Or, you know, do all these maneuvers, etc. But here, you're talking about a whole bunch of planes and they're just getting into a scrap. And you don't have an awful lot of input into that. But that said, you know, I've played games that are low decision space, like solo games that are like A Wing and a Prayer, uh, Picket Duty, which I did a video of, um, there's games like B-17, Queen of the Skies, The Hunters, and so on. All that kind of solo game or solitaire game where you are literally just rolling on pages and pages of charts and seeing what happens. This doesn't really feel like that, though. And I can't really put my finger on exactly why, but I think it might be to do with the fact that you're not really just rolling dice and seeing what events are happening to your planes. You're rolling dice to see what happens when they, you know, when they get into a combat or when they drop their bombs or when they go through a flak field or whatever. Um, and I think that makes it feel a bit different to just sitting there as a kind of passive observer. And also, I say it's a low decision space game, but there are decisions to be made. Like when you when you actually get to move freely, you can decide, okay, how am I going to try and approach my target? In some cases, you can decide to split your squadron into two flights, and when do you want to do that, and should you do that? Should you go back to base? Should you lower yourself to a lower altitude so you can maybe bomb more effectively, but at the cost of possibly being able to get hit by flak? and so on. So there are decisions to be made in the game, but they're just not very frequent, I guess, or not very widespread. And it might be why I actually think this game works a bit better as a solo game than as a two-player game, which is what it's ostensibly designed for. Because as a one-player game, there's enough decisions, because you're making decisions for both sides, to kind of keep you engaged. But as a two-player game, it's more like, you know, you've got your own decisions to worry about only and you, you, the other side's decisions are not your problem, they're your opponent's. So maybe it's just, you know, the density of the decision space is high enough in a one-player game to make it not really an issue. But again, it really depends on what you think and what you're comfortable with. But... You know, I have seen people describing this as like a flaw in the game, and I don't really believe that that is at all. You know, the game is designed by Lee Brimmicken Wood, who knows rather a lot about World War II air combat and air combat in general. And it's a pretty darn good simulation of how air combat worked in World War II with propeller planes and squadrons and early jets and so on. So this is just how it worked. Like, when you got into a scrap, Sure, there was some skill involved, but a lot of the time it was just bullets flying around and just dumb luck whether you got out in one piece or not. Some people definitely had the skill to control that a lot more, but you know, it's a chaotic experience. And so there's a lot of dice rolling involved to simulate that and a lot of chance in the mix there. So don't go into it expecting to have an awful lot of control over everything. You've got some control over some things but between the fact that you know your missions are kind of fixed you can't do anything really outside of that until you tally your target once you get into a combat it's basically just down to calculating modifiers and rolling on tables to see what you know how that ends up and even whether you survive the combat as a, as a unit or not there's a lot of places where that control isn't really in your hands beyond trying to set it up so that you maximize the number of favorable modifiers. But that said, it doesn't feel like it's entirely like you're just a spectator. So go into it with that kind of expectation. And I think you'll enjoy the game a lot more than if you're just thinking, oh, it's a game where I should be able to control a lot more aspects of the planes and what they're doing. Because... In reality, a lot of that stuff was out of people's control. So with that, I'll leave it there. But I think that's covered most of the major concepts. If you can get your head around those before you get into the game, then you're going to appreciate the game a lot more.
if you modify your expectations if you had any beforehand to to fit those it's going to be a better experience for you i think but as it is it's a pretty fun game once you get used to those ideas and um, there's certainly like tons of scenarios i think it's something like 120 ish or something at the last count i don't quote me on that but it's kind of up there anyway in that that region and they go from small and easy ones like this is one of the the simpler scenarios to like massive many squadrons flying around kind of scenarios where um, i don't know how long those would take but i'd imagine they take quite a long time to finish so yeah i think that's about it for the concept and uh, then we can get on to actually starting a scenario and i'll take you through how to play the game so thanks for watching i'll see you next time ta-ta